Well, today we have a message for you, and um, it is entitled, Wearing the Servant's Towel. Wearing the Servant's Towel. Now, I want to let you in on a little secret before we get started, but uh, Pastor Jose and Pastor Brad and, and Brian and myself, we talk to one another. We talk, we do. And just about every week we come together and we talk and we pray, and a lot of things we talk about is about you guys. Now, not gossiping or anything bad, but just for the simple fact that we love the Word of God, and honestly, we love all of you, so we talk about where you are in your spiritual walk. Where exactly are our people spiritually? And so as we're sitting down and brainstorming and talking and praying, we realize one thing, that outside on that marquee, the name says Hollywood Community Church. And when you log on to www.rhcc.com, it says Hollywood Community Church. And if we're going to wear the name tag of a community church, then we should get involved in our community. And so Pastor Brian has commissioned me to kind of go out and to develop contacts and develop resources and to encourage us, myself and the pastors included, encourage us to get involved in the community. And so if you look around the exterior of the worship center today, the, the, the exterior is full of, our, of, of house guests today. Different companies that we've affiliated ourselves with and that we've developed contacts with are here today, and they each one have a sign-up sheet to take your interest. So what do you say we, we get directly into the message on this morning? If you would, turn with me to John 13. St. John chapter 13. And the passage we're going to look at is 13, 1 through 17. But I want to take just a close look at the third verse through the fifth verse. Because here's the climax. Here's the gist of it. Here's the meat of the matter. John 13 and 3 says this. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He lay aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around them. Let's pray. Most gracious and eternal Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us uh, this day. God, we don't take it for granted that you've given us an opportunity to crack our eyes open this morning and to see your sun shining and to get out and to be active and to make it here to worship together. God, we pray that you would open up our ears and open up our hearts to receive your word on today. I pray that you would use your servant as an extension of your love to your people. Lord, carry us through this day and allow us to grow because of what you intended in your word. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and we thank you. Amen. Amen. So as we just read in John 3 through 5, we just... We, we just noticed that Jesus did something peculiar and, and something interesting, I should say. And we've all probably heard this story. If you're churched, you've heard the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet, right? And according to this biblical account, Jesus rose from supper and he tied a towel around his waist and he proceeded to go and wash the disciples' feet. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about the wrapping of the towel and wearing the servant's towel, hence the title of the message today. We'll talk a little bit more about wearing the servant's towel. But as of now, I want to point out something, that when Jesus stood up and he wrapped that towel around his waist, and when he took his outer garment off and he began to wrap that towel around his waist, culturally, the disciples and anyone else who was looking on during that time knew and understood what he was doing. And so I started thinking, what cultural things do we know and understand about a towel? Or what cultural things could we do that, that people will understand about uh, regarding a towel? Okay, so here, here it is. Here's a, here's a simple towel. 
Now, I'm going to do a few things with this towel, and you'll tell me, based on our American culture, if you recognize the things that I'm doing, okay? And I'll give you some hints, and we'll see if you can guess. So it's okay to yell out. It's okay to yell your answer out loud. It's not okay to throw things, okay? Sometimes I get that. I don't know if people like to throw things at me. Mike, put the tomatoes away, all right? So it's not okay to throw things. Just yell your answer out, and I'll give you some hints. Okay, I'm in a hot room, and there's a lot of steam, and... uh, all right, it's steaming. Anyone guessing? Anyone guessing? Sauna, sauna. Okay, good guess, good guess. All right, uh, let's see. In a locker room or at a beach. Wait, anyone get this one? Yeah, the, the, the good old popping with a towel trick. Nothing, when you're a freshman in high school, nothing says to a young lady, I think you're beautiful, more than a vicious slap to the leg with a towel. All right, here's the last one, here's the last one. Let's see if you guys can catch this one or not. This happens to be one of my favorites. Let's see if you guys can figure this one out. Huh? Boxing? Good guess, but that was Taibo. That was really Taibo. That was Taibo. I was planning on Zumba, but Jenny told me don't even think about it. Don't even think. No, 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 you're right, you're right. It was boxing, boxing. So that, those are some things culturally that we understand, that we see and we get it. We can see those things happening with the towel and we, we understand. We grasp right away what's going on. So the disciples knew and understood what Jesus was doing when he put on the servant's towel. All right, so before we go and delve into the passage itself, there's two things I want you to understand. Two things that we need to know and get a grasp on to really understand the significance of the example that Jesus gave in washing the disciples' feet. First, we need to know we need to know that Jesus was fully in control and aware of the situation during the Passover meal. He was fully in control and he was fully aware. If you're taking notes, write that down. Jesus knew and he understood and he controlled the situation during this Passover meal in which he happened to wash the disciples' feet. The first verse that clues us in on that is the very first verse in 13, which says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own disciples who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And then verse 3. Verse 3 also clues us in that Jesus knew and was in full control. Verse 3 says that Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. So Jesus knew and understood two things. He knew that all things were given into his hands. He knew that his time was winding up, that it was about time for him to approach the cross of Calvary. He, he knew his time was coming. He also knew that all things were given into his hands, meaning that he knew and understood that he was in authority in this situation. He was in control. So Jesus was fully aware and in control during this situation. The second thing we need to know and we need to understand is this. Jesus was very deliberate In his act of service. Jesus was very deliberate. Or if I could use a synonym, a word that's the same as deliberate. Jesus was very intentional about his act of service in washing the disciples' feet. The verse that tells us this is 13 and 4. 13 and 4 says this. He rose from supper and laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel tied it around his waist. So right there we see that Jesus got up from supper. Everyone sitting around eating and drinking. And Jesus gets up. So right away he draws the attention of everyone who's there eating and drinking with him. And then he goes, he proceeds to go and remove his outer garment. Take off his outer garment and wrap the servant's towel around himself. Now this is significant because Jesus removing his outer garment was a social cue. 
Because in biblical times, your outer garment kind of signified to everyone around you who exactly you were socially, what social class you were part of. If you were a soldier, you wore a certain outer garment. If you were a priest, you had this elaborate outer garment. In fact, if you were poor or a beggar, or you, if you were a specified type of beggar, a blind or crippled beggar, you wore a certain outer garment to signify who you were. People knew who you were by how you dressed, by your outer garment. This is why in, in the book of Mark, we see in, in Mark 10.50, we see that Jesus calls the blind man to heal him. And the Bible says, according to Mark 10.50, that the blind man immediately threw off his outer garment to go and be healed by Jesus. You see, he was sending a message socially through everyone who could see him. I'm no longer a blind beggar. I'm going to be healed and given sight by the Savior. So he threw off his outer garment. In the same way, Jesus took off his outer garment and identified himself as a servant. The second verse that clues us in in this fact is verse 7. Matthew 13 and 7 says, And Jesus answered him, him being Peter, what, am I, what I'm doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. And then also verse 12. Verse 12 says, When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? Do you guys see what I did here? You see, Jesus with the disciples did a lot of miraculous things. He did a lot of acts of service. There was just not one particular thing that Jesus did. You see, in his ministry, there was plenty and bountiful miracles and services. But not very often does Jesus say, hey, do you see what I just did here? Hey, did you guys catch that? When he was walking on water, he didn't say, hey, guys. I'm walking on water. I'm showing you that I'm divine here. Check this out. This is water. I'm walking on it. You can't do this. He didn't do that. In fact, the woman at the well, he didn't say, hey, disciples, check this out. I'm going to go talk to this Samaritan woman over here. I'm connecting Jews and Samaritans. We don't like each other. I'm going to go do this. Pay attention. No, he didn't do that. He didn't call attention to himself often in what he did. But in this particular instance, in washing the disciples' feet, Jesus says twice, what I'm about to do, you don't understand, but you will understand. And then after he finishes, he says, hey, did you catch what I just did here? Did you see this? Did you understand this? You see, Jesus attracts attention to himself. He was very deliberate. He was very intentional. This was his purpose. This was one of the last acts of service that Jesus did before he went to the cross of Calvary. So he was very intentional in showing his disciples his act of service. And so the two things that we need to know and we need to grasp is that Jesus was aware. He was in control and he was intentional about the example that he set. And so what that means for us here today is that if Jesus was serious about showing us the example... We need to be serious about taking his example. Amen? So what do you say we get directly into the passage? So throughout John 13, 1 through 17, there are four major, four huge examples that Jesus shows us in servitude. Four huge examples. And the first one is love for his disciples. First example that Jesus showed us in his act of service was love. And that's right there in the first and second verse. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of the world, having loved his own, having loved his own who were with him, he loved them until the end. And during the supper, when the devil had already put in the heart of Judas Iscariot Simon, uh, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. You see, Jesus knew who was there, who was, who was with him. He knew that Judas' heart had already been turned against him. But the Bible says that he loved his disciples. And he loved them until the very end. And you see, our goal and our motivation behind service 
is not because it's a nice thing to do. It's not because it makes us look good to do it. It's because we should love God's people. The Bible says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And if God took the time to put together this next human being, this neighbor of mine, this person that I can see, touch, and feel, if God took the time to put them together, and if he loved them enough to create them and put them here, then I myself, loving God, should love his most valuable creation. And so our motivation behind our service is just as Jesus' motivation was for serving the disciples, for washing their feet. His motivation was love. The second example that Jesus gives us in his service is humility. Jesus was humble in his service. Verses 3 through 5 read as this. Jesus, knowing that the Father... uh, Excuse me, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a a towel, tied it around his waist. And then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around them. You see, as we just discussed, Jesus removing his outer garments, wrapping the servant's towel around himself was a humble act in and of itself. Jesus signified himself as a servant. He identified himself as a servant. So when we, when we take a look at the humility of Christ here, there's some, some things that we should know and some things that we should understand. You see, the act of foot washing was not uncommon. And in fact, Jewish ceremonial cleansing, especially during these this time of Passover and during these meals, it was very customary culturally. And in fact, most gathering meals, it was customary to have a foot washing. Just that it's customary for us to wash our hands before we eat in America. It was very customary, very common for them to have a foot washing before a meal. And it wasn't just anyone who did the foot washing. In fact, they didn't go and they didn't wash their own feet. Because chances are, if you were going to gather and have a meal, the person who was hosting the gathering was wealthy enough to host the gathering, therefore was wealthy enough to have a servant. And so a servant was assigned to do the foot washing before the meal. But it wasn't just any servant who was assigned to do this foot washing. It was a lower-ranked servant. You see, because within Israel, within the Jewish culture itself, there was indentured servitude. So there were Jews who actually worked and served under Jews. But if you were a Jew that worked and served under another Jew, you did not have to worry about doing this this menial task. This was your lower-ranking servant. You know, this was the guy that you didn't want going into your refrigerator. This was the the lower-ranked servant that would do the foot washing. And so Jesus not only takes on the identity of a servant, but he takes on the identity of a lowly servant. And so in his humility, we notice that there's something that the disciples miss. Because as we just said, it was customary for them to come in and have the foot washing and the foot cleansing before a meal. And so we see in Scripture that the, 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 the disciples had come in and they had started eating without washing their feet. They had already been eating. And this was uncommon. This was not according to culture. This was not common to culture. They had already began eating. And the Bible says Jesus rose from supper. During the meal, Jesus rise, rises from supper. Right smack in the middle of the meal. Now, how would you say this is in the middle of the meal? Because we see later in verse 26 that Jesus goes back and he sops bread. And he says, the one who doesn't sop is going to betray me, referring to Judas. So he goes back and he sops and they resume eating. But in the middle of the meal, Jesus stands up and he begins to wash feet. And the disciples see what he is doing and they recognize something. They recognize they blew it. 
Because they came in and they walked past the servant's towel and they walked past the servant's basin. They walked past and they sat down and did something that was not accord according to their culture, something that was not normal, something that was not common. And they all sat and they started to eat. No one washed their feet. It wasn't, a, it wasn't common. It wasn't a common thing, you see. And so when Jesus gets up and begins to wash feet, they recognize that they blew it. So the question that comes out of that knowledge, well, why didn't the disciples know to do this? Why didn't they jump in and, 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 and take the place of the lowly servant instead of having the, the rabbi, the Messiah, the king of kings, instead of having their leader do it, why didn't one of them jump in and do it? Well, a lot of scholars speculate and a lot of people give kind of a roundabout answer. And you know what? There's a question that kind of puts this into perspective because there's no real clear answer here. But there's a question that puts it back into perspective. And that question is, why do we miss opportunities to serve? You see, the disciples blew it. The disciples missed an opportunity to serve. It was right there. It was plain. It was something they would have expected. But they blew it. They missed an opportunity to serve. And you see, I like the way the NASB, the New American Standard Bible, I like the way the NASB kind of words this verse. Because it words it pretty much the same as we just read, taking uh, the servant's towel and, and uh, a basin. But the NASB says it this way. He took the basin. Instead of a basin, the basin. Now, the isn't in the original Greek. But according to our culture and our grammar and the way that we speak, speak, the is proper there. The works a little bit better than a. Now, why is that? Because if any one of us have ever written a paper, or if you're like me in grade school, you write a paper, and the teacher gives it back to you with these marks on the paper and says, okay, correct this, this is grammatically incorrect, fix this, fix this. And so one thing that I learned in my early stages of writing is that you cannot start a sentence with the unless the the that is referring to a subject has a known or familiar subject. For example, if I'm writing a paper talking about cars, I cannot all of a sudden put a, a sentence right smack in the middle of the paper and say, the dog chased the car. Because the teacher will hand that paper back to me with that red mark that says, the dog, what dog? What dog are you talking about? You can't start a sentence with the unless you know what you're talking about, unless it is an understood subject. And so when the NASB says the basin instead of a basin, it would seem as though it doesn't make sense because what basin are they talking about? What basin is it that the Bible is referring to? Well, the Greek term for basin there simply is a vessel used to wash hands and feet. And so the basin in the Greek is a specific basin. So what does all of that mean? As a matter of fact, let's, let's ask me, what does that mean on three? Let's all ask that question. One, two, three. What does that mean? Okay, since you're going to be so pushy about it, I'll tell you. I'll tell you, what, I'll tell you what that means. It means that the disciples knew why the basin was there. They knew what the basin was for. They were familiar with why and what the basin was there for. It wasn't for them. It wasn't a basin. It was the basin. They expected to see it. And guess what? They walked right by it. They blew it. This is why, this is why they were known as the disciples. That was the, that was the letter grade for them. They were the disciples. But you see, as they learned and they grew up, they later became the apostles. So they did, they did progress. They did get a little better. They did get a little better. But you see, initially the, the, the disciples missed an opportunity to serve. So I'll tell you this. We have an opportunity to serve here at Hollywood Community Church. And in fact, today we set the atmosphere to present these opportunities to serve. So what does our servant's basin and servant's towel look like. Our servant's basin and servant's towel at Hollywood Community Church more than likely has a food for the poor emblem on it. 
or maybe an open heart food pantry emblem, love bag, or maybe a raven's ministry, or maybe a, a heart to heart organization, or maybe a, a Hope Women's Center, or maybe a Hollywood Civic Association, a cash for trash emblem on it. You see, these are, these are opportunities to serve. And I want to encourage you, don't make the same mistakes the disciples made. Don't walk past the servant's basin and the servant's towel. Don't miss your opportunity to serve. Even bigger than that, the moment that you step outside of that door, there's your servant's basin and your servant's towel. Because every day that we walk outside of these four walls, there is an opportunity for us to serve. And it's very easy to fall into that mental trap to think that God called us to take a seat in a church when really and truly God called us to make an impact in our community. That's our calling. We weren't commissioned to sit and take a seat here. We come here to prepare ourselves. We come here to get ready like a soldier and train and receive ammunition and receive our weaponry and receive the tools that we need to go make an impact out there. You see, the great commission that Jesus gave us was to sit down and have a good time. No, it wasn't. No, no, not actually. The great commission that Jesus gave us was to go out. To go out. Don't make the same mistakes the disciples made and miss your opportunity to serve. The third example that Jesus gives us in his act of service was spiritual cleansing. And in fact, let's take a look at his discourse with Peter. You see, when Jesus approached Peter to wash his feet initially, Peter said, wait, wait, Jesus. Let's take a look there. 13 and 6 says this, and he came to Simon Peter, and Simon Peter said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, what I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. And Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but he is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew that who was to betray him, and that's why he said... Not all of you are clean. But when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? So in his discourse with Peter, when Peter tells Jesus, well, wait one second, Jesus. No, no, no. All right. Don't wash my feet. I'm not worthy for you to wash my feet. And Jesus says something to him. He said, if I do not wash you, you have no part in me. Okay? Now, this wasn't saying to Peter, listen, your feet smell really bad, and if I don't wash them, you can't come with us. No, no, that's, that's not what he was saying. He was speaking of a spiritual truth. And this represented a spiritual truth to Simon Peter. You see, Jesus wasn't there preaching the gospel to Simon Peter. He wasn't teaching him scripture. He wasn't doing the miraculous. He was doing a simple act of service. And what that says to us here today is that our simple acts of service carry great spiritual tr truth to people who look on. I think about my time out in the food pantry. And we have the food pantry set up to where people kind of drive through. It's a drive through system. And on the other end of the parking lot, we have walk-ups. And people who don't have cars walk up and we feed those families that come through and they need food for their families. And we feed each one of them. And we have a station for bread. And they drive and they get their bread. And then we have a section for boxes with groceries. And they drive through and they get the boxes. And right at the end, there's a section for produce. And once they pick it all up, there's someone waiting on them at the end of the line to pray. And they just drive right through, bang, 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 and they're gone. I cannot tell you how many times people have come to me and said, man, I like the way this is ran. I like the way that you guys have organized this. And you know what that says to me? It really says to me that whatever I do for God, I need to make sure that I'm doing it to the best of my ability. 
People looked at that act of service. Now there's no one out there in the bread line evangelizing. We don't have Pastor Brian out on a soapbox preaching the word as people go through uh, for their food boxes. There's no one out there uh, uh, laying on hands or, or doing any miraculous signs. There's none of that going on out there at the food pantry. But time and time again, people come to me and they say, I have recognized a big spiritual truth in what you're doing. So can I tell you that God hadn't called all of us to be preachers. God hadn't called all of us to stand up before a group and proclaim his word. But you know what? Your biggest message, your biggest sermon is your simple acts of service. People will look at what you do. It's okay, you can clap. <laughs> People look at what you do, guys. They notice and they see. And you know what? To them, that says a lot more about God. And that says a lot more about Jesus than, quite frankly, I do. Because I'll stand here with you for about 30 to 40 minutes, and we'll, and we'll refer to Scripture, and we'll learn, and we'll grow. But guess what? It is your acts of service. It is what you do out of love. It's the love that you show out there that really preaches Jesus in our community. And guess what? Those simple acts of service will reach those people that won't ever step a foot in this church. So remember that. Jesus Christ showed us an example of spiritual cleansing in his act of service. The third thing that he showed was, uh, the third example that he showed was spiritual cleansing. And then lastly, verses 12 through 17, the Bible says this. And when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. And truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. If you know these things, Jesus says, you're blessed if you do them. And so Jesus here is, is telling them, hey, did you see what I just did? I am serving as your model of servitude. I am being your example here because if you call me Lord and you call me teacher and you see that I have washed your feet, then you too as well should do the same. Now Jesus wasn't calling each one of us to go out with a bowl and start scrubbing people's feet. The purpose that Jesus was making here, the point that he was making was that we should also go out and be of service. But the example that he gave was just not simply being of service. The example that he gave was lowering ourselves and serving in humility and serving in love. Because the reason that he did all, did all of this, according to verse 1, was that he loved them first and foremost. And secondly, the example that he gave, without saying a word about humility, the example that he gave was one of humility. And so he is our model of servitude. And so when we talk about why is it that we don't serve more, I ask myself that question. Why is, it, why is it that I don't serve more? And you know what? Those two things come up, love and humility. You see, pride is a poison, and it prevents us from following God. And the one thing that we don't want to do is we don't want to identify ourselves as being lower than we are. See, one social, goal, one, one social goal that most of us set for ourselves is to show other people that I am just as good as you, I am just as well-spoken, I am just as well-dressed, I have just as much as you have, and don't look at me any less. That's, that's one of the, the common social goals according to our culture. It is very uncommon for someone to voluntarily say, hey, you guys are much higher than me. So look at yourself as higher and look at me as lower. But that's exactly what Jesus did by wearing that servant's top. And that's exactly one thing that even I myself have struggled with. We don't want to put ourselves in a vulnerable position. 
I remember once I was traveling down I-95 and I saw a guy out on the side of the road and he was a, a younger guy about my age and his tire had blew and I pulled over and I said, hey man, what do you need? Do you need to stop somewhere? He says, yeah, can you take me by the tire shop? And I know a tire guy who will call a tow truck and the tow truck will come get my car and everything's taken care of. I said, okay, fine, let's go over. And I took him and he called the tow truck and I went back home and people that were close to me at the time said, hey man, that was, that was very risky. Because it was at night, you didn't know if this guy was pulled over to set you up for a trap. You didn't know if he really wanted to rob you. You didn't know what was going on. That was a, be a very bad choice. And you got a wife and kids at home. You got a family to make it home to. I know you want to help people, but don't put yourself out there and make yourself vulnerable. Don't do that. And you know what I said? I said, you know what? That's a good advice. And so for years, I drove down I-95. And if I ever saw someone stranded, I didn't look twice. And then I got to a point where I would pull into the gas station, and if I saw someone stranded, whether a woman, a man, or not, I didn't look twice. And so that's what happens to us. Pride comes in and says, you know what? I have to preserve myself. I have to preserve my funds. I have to preserve my energy. I have to preserve what I have. And I don't know what they're going to do with what I give anyway, so I have to preserve me. But Jesus put on the line the most valuable thing that he had, his own reputation. Time and time again he does this. Time and time again in serving the prostitute who anointed his head with oil, the Pharisees would stand and say, does Jesus not know who this woman is? Why is he letting her touch him? Why is Jesus, why does he put his own reputation, the king of kings, why does he put his own reputation on the line time and time again to show us service? He does it because that's what we need to do. That's what we're called to do. And in your act of service, in your act of humbly serving, guess what? There are times when you have to lower yourself and do as the Bible says, and esteem others higher than yourself. In high school, we had a guy named Terrence. And Terrence was a big old guy, and I think he had a couple of screws loose. And, you know, he would just walk up to people at lunchtime and snatch their food off of their tray and just walk down the hall and eat it. And, you know, Terrence eventually became like a social outcast, and no one ever talked to Terrence. And I remember one day at the bus stop, Terrence was over there sitting by himself. And one of my buddies tells me, hey, man, $10 says you won't go over there and sit with Terrence. And I said, you know, 10 bucks ain't enough to go sit with that guy. You think I'm going to go sit over there? I'll be humiliated sitting over there with Terrence. So can you imagine how I would feel going to go sit over by this guy by myself at the, at the, the dirty bus terminal? Could you imagine how I would feel? And then just jokingly, my buddy said something to me that stuck with me. Just jokingly, he says, <laughs> well, imagine how Terrence feels sitting over there by himself. You see, I was concerned about how I felt going over to him. I had never taken into consideration how he felt being by himself. And so before you consider yourself and say, hey, I don't want to approach that guy. He looks a little bit shaky. He looks a little bit dirty. I don't know if I want to go put myself in that situation. I don't know if that's something that I'm comfortable doing. I would encourage you, listen, consider others before you. Extend yourself and stretch yourself beyond your own comfort zone. And humbly serve. Amen? Finally, the, the, the final theme of Christ's service is this. And if you've heard nothing that I've said this entire time, I want you to hear this and I want you to understand this. Verse 16, Jesus Christ says this. Truly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. And the truth there is this, none of us are greater than Christ. None of us are bigger than Christ. Christ is bigger than all of us. Christ is more than all of us here. Am I right in saying that? I bet most of us would agree there. Most of us would agree and say, I know that I'm not superior to Christ. Mostly, if not all of us, would say, yes, I know that I'm no bigger than Jesus Christ. I know that. But what happens is this, is Jesus came to serve. 
And so we don't say it with our words that we think that we're bigger than Jesus Christ. We don't say it out of our mouth. But if we're not careful, that is exactly what our attitude says. That is exactly what we say in our actions. When Jesus Christ humbled himself and made himself Lord to serve, and we say, I'm not going to do that. No, no, no. I'm too good to do that. No, no, no. I'm not going to expose myself to that. In your actions, what you're saying is, Christ, I know you did it, but I'm not going to do it. And you are not good enough to, to stop from doing that, but I am. So if we're not careful, what we say in our actions speaks a lot louder than what we say with our words. And although we can proclaim that, I know that Christ is bigger. I know that Christ is superior. If we're not careful, what we say in our actions is that, you know what, I think I'm a little bigger. I think I'm a little more important. Be careful in that. Be careful in that. Knowing that it's important to humble ourselves before our brothers and sisters. But it's just as important to humble ourselves before an almighty God. Amen? And so where, where does all of this tie in? Where does this fit? Where, where are our opportunities to serve? When, when are we called to put on the, the servant's towel and take off the outer garment? And wear the servant's towel. When are we called to do that? Hey, Brian, kick off your shoes and tell me. No, I'm joking. <laughs> no, no. When, when are we called to, to wear the servant's towel? When is that our calling? Well, today we have here visiting with us. And I'm so glad that we were all on our best behavior because we have company at the house today. Today is feeding food for the poor. Food for the poor happens to be the largest international relief agency in the United States of America. And not only do they provide food and feeding opportunities for the poor, but they provide a plethora, a whole, a whole gambit of different, different services to the poor and the less fortunate. And what Kalasha told me when she came up, she said, one thing I want you to mention about our ministry is that we are a Christ-centered ministry. Isn't that wonderful? The largest relief agency in America is based right here in Florida and is a Christian organization. Isn't that wonderful? But not only that, but she said, our goal is to connect a first world church like ourselves here. Is to connect the first world churches with third world churches. That's our goal, and what a wonderful goal it is to have. So listen, don't leave here today without going over and talking to Kalasha and those guys over there about their wonderful organization. Secondly, our very own Linda Earl is right there in the back waiting on you as well. She's waiting for you to come and sign the entry sheet. There's, there's our love back ministry with our very own Open Heart Food Pantry. And the Open Heart Food Pantry serves anywhere from 70 to 100 families every single week right here on campus. But you know what, a lot of times we would say, I don't have the time, I can't come out on Saturday from 9 to 11, it's really busy. If you don't have the time, no problem. The love bag ministry that Linda Earl heads up, simply pack your own love bags. In fact, you don't even have to buy the food. We will provide the food and the bag. All you have to do is put the food in the bag and when you see someone out there, homeless, without anything to eat, then right there you have a bag ready in your car to serve the poor as you go. Amen? That's Linda Earl in the Love Bag Ministry. And Linda, she, she, she tells me one thing. She says, I want you to mention I'm open for suggestions. So if anyone says, hey, I think it's a good idea maybe to add some lotions or toothbrush or toothpaste. We have those occasionally. If someone says, hey, I think it's a good idea and I want to contribute that, you're more than welcome. Socks or lotions or, to or whatever have you, you're welcome to do that. Thirdly, Ravens Ministries, right straight ahead. This is a, an organization that we're directly affiliated with. And Pastor Calvin, Adam, Cal Calvin Adams is the CEO of Ravens Ministries. And Ravens Ministries supplies other food banks and other soup kitchens throughout the state of Florida. 
And what they also do is they provide training and insight on other organizations that want to start a soup kitchen or a food bank. And on December 6th, they're having a huge event up in Deerfield Beach. They're having a huge event where they are actually going into an apartment complex and taking it for Christ. A bunch of people there are impoverished without food. They're going to go in and they're going to provide a box of food to every single resident at this apartment complex. They're going to go and provide household materials. They're going to go and they're going to pray and they're going to minister to everyone in that apartment complex in their own home. And so what Calvin said to me, what Pastor Adam said to me is that, hey, listen, we have the food and we have the house taken care of. We just need some prayer warriors. We just need some people that are willing to share their time with those people out in that apartment complex. If that's you, don't miss your opportunity to serve. Don't miss your servant's towel and your servant's basin. Calvin Adams is right there. Clay Brazington, right here, heart-to-heart -heart organization. Clay says to me, he says, listen, this is what I want you to mention. 60% of people in assistant living facilities, 60% of them never, ever receive visitors. 60% of people in these living facilities never, ever receive a visitor. And we just want people to volunteer, as I put my jacket on upside down. <laughs> we, we want people to volunteer to help me put my jacket on the right way. Okay? That's a big ministry. We, we want people to volunteer to help Clay minister to these people in these assistant living facilities that never ever get a visitor during the whole year. Let's face it, a lot of these people in these, in these assistant living f facilities are on their last legs. They're not going anywhere but there. They're, a lot of them don't have any hope of going back home. And aside from the hopeless of knowing that they probably won't ever go, go back home, they also sit day in and day out without anyone to talk to without anyone to spend any time with, without anyone to open up a box of checkers or, or flick on the football game. If you're one that just has time, you don't need a whole lot. You don't need any specific skills. If you just have time, don't miss Clay. Amen? Hope Women's Center. And I want to I say that Hope Women's Center is one of our more proactive ministries because before I could go and ask her, hey, what do you want me to say? She had this note ready. She had it ready. She said, I already got it covered. This is what you're going to say. So I'm going to stick to my script, okay? Hope Women's Center is a place of safety, compassion, and love where women are encouraged and equipped to make informed choices regarding unplanned pregnancies. And so this is... This is an opportunity to go and to serve women who, are, women who are victim of abuse, victim of unfortunate circumstances, women who are hurting and struggling. Hope Women's Center is, is your place to serve. If you have a passion for women and women's ministry and hurting women, Hope Women's Center will be your servant's basin and your servant's towel. And last but not least, I've been given a script for our, our last ministry as well. And uh, the city of Hollywood, the Driftwood Civic Association, is a neighborhood group of resident volunteers who work together to create positive changes in the community. In fact, on December 13th, Saturday morning from 9 a.m. to 12 noon, we will be participating in the city of Hollywood's Cash for Trash program to raise funds for the association and to clean up the neighborhood. So if you have any questions, please see uh, Donna Biederman, and she has contact information for you. Once again, another huge opportunity for you to get plugged in and to serve. And during this time, during the life group signups, each and every one of you that sign up for a life group, you're not exempt. You may, you may leave here and not sign any one of those interest sheets. But if you're signed up for a life group, if you participate in any ministry, eventually an opportunity to serve will confront you intentionally. We're going to bring something to you to say, hey, there's an option. There's an opportunity for you to serve. The servant's basin and the servant's towel is right here. Don't walk past it. How many people notice the towel and basin right outside the door coming in? How many people notice? See, it's, 
It's easy to see it, but guess what? A lot of times you walk right past it. A lot of times you see it and you don't know what it means. The same with these opportunities to serve. Don't walk past it. You won't be uninformed. We'll tell you what it means. Contact me at the church office. We would love to have you guys plugged in and serving. If we're going to be Hollywood Community Church, we should be a community church. Amen? Amen.